Actually, egalitarian, and you will inevitably find a statist, said Murray Rothbard once. Hello, I am Chris Wilkinson, presenter of The Libertarian Listener, and in today's edition we've got Sean Finch of the Libertarian Party UK. He's the Kent County Group leader. Hello there. Hello, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Right, so the first topic of conversation will be on the NHS. And uh, Professor Dr. Nut Wachowski, I'm not entirely sure of the pronunciation, but he's a biostatistics scholar, is saying that developing herd immunity as fast as possible is the best strategy for dealing with the coronavirus. And as part of that, keeping schools open, pubs open, shops open, which is contrary to the actions of most governments. He states that flattening the curve will unnecessarily prolong the outbreak. And there's a long interview with him, which I'd highly encourage people to watch and I'll provide a link to it in the description of this video. Now, considering it places politics before medical science, do you believe that flattening the curve was the right strategy for the government to adopt? I do agree with, uh, is it Professor or Dr. Wachowski? I definitely do agree with his his method. I think that this idea of closing all of the schools, closing especially the small businesses and the economy, I think is a reckless decision. And is even a point now where I think that Richie Sunak and other cabinet members need to resign after this because I think the ramifications of what's coming now, I mean, it's at least going to be a recession, possibly even an economic depression, and that is going to take a lot more lives than this COVID-19 will ever do. And it won't just affect the vulnerable and the elderly, it's going to affect every single individual. So I'm very much with Wachowski on that. Yeah. Obviously, the Imperial College model in which the government's basing its actions upon has been updated all the time. The latest statistics suggested that the NHS is underprepared to deal with the coronavirus in terms of hospital beds, in terms of intensive care spaces. We've got Nightingale hospitals popping up all over the country to meet the projected healthcare demand, and we actually don't have very long to do it in. Considering what the scientists and scholars are now saying, could we assume that the reason why the British government adopted the flattening the curve strategy was because they knew that the NHS at heart could not cope with the pandemic? It is looking more to me that this is more of a political decision. Is it that they've done that to help the NHS or are they simply just following the trend of all, like a domino effect in a way? Of all of the other nations and if they dare to question the narrative that the mainstream media seems to be heavily pushing and pushing this idea of fear and uh, and, and panic and a twitterati as they're called you know the people on <laughs> They're influencing government so much. Only a few, only about a month ago, Boris Johnson was going on about allowing commerce to continue what Sweden was basically adopted mm. to just quarantine the people with multiple preconditions and the elderly as well. But, and that was the idea. And all of a sudden, there was this U turn then that now, oh no, we've got to lock down the entire nation. Is it Occam's razor, which suggests that it's, it's the most simplest explanation, is that they're simply just kowtowed to a massive pressure built up by NGOs and mainstream media? I, I think it's more so that. Yeah, I'm not usually one to quote The Guardian, but The Guardian newspaper said, The IHME modelling forecast suggests that by the 4th of August, the UK will see a total of 66,000 deaths taken from a large range estimate of up to 219,000 deaths. The maximum number of deaths with or without the lockdown were roughly similar. It's no wonder the government's now reluctant to release the details of its modelling because it will likely expose the fact that it's the bureaucracy and the mismanagement that mm -hmm. is to blame for the high number of deaths. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, I, uh, I absolutely agree. I, I... Like I said, I think it, the bureaucracy is just as guilty of this, the administration of, of any, not just the NHS, but of, of most things, because it is tripping over its own red tape that it's set. It's almost like setting a mine and then stepping on it. You know, it's just, it's this, they are so inept to deal with anything, regardless of if it's a, a pandemic. And I have my reservations on believing these numbers. I mean, it does make me think as well is that you had the Imperial College London model. And then you had, was it an Oxford model or was it a Cambridge model? I can't remember. 
and the Cambridge or Oxford model were actually far more accurate to what's mm. going on now. But guess what one the mainstream media went with? Well, the one that says that it's going to be black plague levels of death. You know, it, yeah. it's got the, the crazy one because guess what? Fear is profitable. Fear is what sells newspapers and what gets people clicking on clickbait articles, you know, and all this sort of stuff. I don't think at all it's going to be a high, a high amount of death. I mean, I've heard some there's people I've been chatting to and they think it's going to be like 2 million in the UK alone and 600 million worldwide. It's like, what? Because I've also got my skepticism on how these deaths are being recorded because it seems to me now, and, and it's not just me, highly qualified people around the world are stepping up and it's, it has been a bit of a slow kind of path, a courageous path to take, because this is dealing with death specifically. So as soon as you speak out, and I've, I've got loads of hate online, but also at the same time, a lot of private messages saying, oh, yeah, we agree with you. And the reason why they're private, as soon as you go, well, that doesn't sound right. Or, you know, you actually go, well, there's this other guy, there's otherwise. Straight away, oh, you want old people to die. You know, you are an evil person. You only care about money and, uh, and the economy, you know, rather than life. And it's like, no, the economy is life. If you have a crap economy, everything's going to be affected, including the NHS. You might not even have an NHS after this because of the way that it's going. You know, diseases will go up. The, the quality of life will go down. Mental health. I mean, it's already I know personally two people I know have, they're having a very difficult time dealing with this. And people don't think about it because they're, t- they're too much caught up in the emotion. They're too much of, of what's going on now. They don't, they don't see the, the ramifications. They don't see the consequences of their action. I keep saying this quote to them of, you know, you can deny reality, but you can't deny the consequences of reality. You know, and this is, this is what people have got to deal with. They need to now balance what is more important. Is it this, which even if you believe all of these numbers, it's still not living up to the models that Imperial College has stated and various other media outlets have stated as well. It's nowhere near these numbers. It's similar to a typical seasonal influenza. That's what it's looking like. But I think people now have become so invested, they've gone too far with it. They can't go back now. They've gone too far with this. So imagine if Boris or Rishi Sunak came out tomorrow and said, oh, actually, we've made a massive mistake. Let's reopen the economy. Well, it's too late, mate. You, you've destroyed loads of businesses now. So they can't do that. It would be political suicide for them to do that and the mainstream media. They, people will never, ever buy a newspaper again if that was the case. So now they've got to double down. They don't care about the truth anymore. They don't care about people's lives anymore. It's now about I'm right, you're wrong. And that's how bad it's become, unfortunately. And I think if you keep going down this route of this lockdown, there's going to be a lot of civil unrest. It's going to be, we've had the winter of discontent. This will probably be a summer of discontent if the lockdown continues. So going back to what you said there, I distinctly remember in the 2015 general election, David Cameron said one of his most famous quotes, you cannot have a strong NHS without a strong economy. And right now the economy's collapsing and therefore surely the NHS will as well. I just want to draw attention to some of the things that have gone on in the NHS. The GPs have said that the government is publishing incorrect advice on self-isolation. We've had the Chief Medical Officer of Scotland resign after failing to follow her own advice when she visited a second home. And we've had DNR notices sent out to some NHS patients. Do you think that this is all an example of how little the bureaucracy, the NHS, care about people's lives? There is a massive contradiction going on now with what the NHS is saying and what it is doing, because I'm glad you brought up that uh, DNR, do not resuscitate form, because I think people need to know what's going on about this. The whole reason why we have this lockdown is to protect the elderly and the vulnerable to the point where they've even closed the economy, even put healthy people like you and I out of jobs, right? Especially if they're a small business owner. At the same time, the NHS is sending out do not resuscitate forms to the elderly and the vulnerable to say, basically, you may not get adequate health care when the time comes. If that's the case, then why are we in lockdown then? If they're saying that, and it, when I put this question to people, which I already have, the usual answer, oh, well, it's triage. Okay, well, if it's triage then, again, why are we in lockdown then? Because why, why are we as healthy individuals therefore risking destroying the economy and therefore therefore means you will have a destructive NHS. The NHS will be possibly even non-existent. 
Mm. Uh, why are we doing this then? If you believe in triage, then surely we need to be using a triaging life in terms of how we are managing society at the moment and just saying, right, the healthy don't need to be locked down. They all go back out to work, but it's the vulnerable and the elderly that need to be quarantined. Surely that is basically a triage in, in life. That's what we need to do. These people, these pa- these elderly and these vulnerable people, they have contributed throughout their entire life into the state via taxation to the NHS has actually paid for those doctors, paid for those nurses, paid for all those bureaucratic management jobs in the NHS, only for when it actually comes to the point where they, where they need the NHS, the NHS turns around to them and goes, thanks for the money, but we won't be helping you. I think that is disgusting. I think that is Orwellian almost. It's almost like Boxer the horse in Animal Farm. Boxer the horse was the workhorse on the farm. The farm represented the socialist paradise or whatever. And the, and the horse Boxer worked all of his life and he constantly believed in the state that he will look after him one day and whatever. And he plowed every day and eventually he exhausted himself after years and he became old and decrepit. And as soon as he became useless, like he, and he could no longer be used as a worker, he was straight away immediately sent to the blue factory. That mm. is so dark and disgraceful. But people need to wake up and see this. Personal protective equipment, PPE, a massive scandal has emerged. Uh, there's a quote from The Sun here. PPE deliveries to frontline NHS staff delayed by Chinese red tape and scores of protective kits fail UK safety checks. And it goes on to say the crates airlifted to the UK are being removed from planes before takeoff while other boxes are being wrongly labelled. More than 30 NHS staff are believed to have died from coronavirus and campaigners say some of the deaths were a direct result of the lack of PPE. What do you think of the uh, of this scandal? What does it mean for the NHS as an organisation and for those who run it? That, that does not shock me at the slightest. There, there are loads of horror stories like that, even despite COVID-19. The state was warned multiple times to prepare for this pandemic since early as 2013, I think, and they still haven't, they haven't done anything. It's this idea is that, oh, we just need to give the, the NHS more money and then everything will be all right. You could give the NHS a trillion pounds a month and it will never be enough. They'll always want more. It won't solve everything. It is the way the management exists. They're not competing in a free market. They are guaranteed to get your money regardless if they give a good service or a bad service. I mean, if you look at all the deaths that could be saved in the NHS, it boggles the mind. You have to make this a choice. You have to say, if you do a good service, I will give you money. But if it, but if you give you a bad service, I won't give you money. But until until that sort of way changes, this idea that simply that oh we just need the right guy in charge that he's going to change everything, it's just that's not how it works. It's the entire psychology behind it. It's the entire uh, culture behind it. Of we just need a bit more money. It's not that oh it, it, the whole thing needs to be totally changed. In my opinion, you, can, you change this easily by simply making this about choice. If this is a choice thing, as soon as the NHS realizes that if we do a bad job, we won't get any money, suddenly, and I'm talking about the frontline nurses or anything like that, I'm talking about the actual managers and administrative body, if we don't actually like pull our fingers out and actually start doing something and actually getting these PPE in there on time and make it more efficiently, cut costs somewhere, that we might be out of a job. But that doesn't exist in NHS. This is why the, the whole structure of, of how we see money and how we see taxation, it needs to change dramatically, quickly, before it's too late. Obviously, it's a good thing that Prime Minister Boris Johnson has left hospital. We're now destined to be the worst affected country in Europe, according to most of the modelling. And the media is constantly lavishing the government with praise for how it's handled the crisis. How much is the media to blame for the public hysteria and blind panic that has occurred as well? Massively. Absolutely massively. It it profits off fear. I can't remember, was it the Oxford one? I think it was Oxford. There was an Oxford model as well that had far less death rates. And and it's actually looking to be more accurate than the uh, Imperial College London one. And they chose the Imperial College London one because it had far greater death, far greater panic. I like, I like the old saying, I think it was said by um, President Obama's chief of staff, never let a good crisis go to waste. 
Um, mm. And because of that, not just the media, but also governments around the world have taken advantage. And I'm, I'm not saying that they're all on Skype calls like this, having a little all the world leaders are meeting up and having a big conspiracy. I'm not saying that, oh, you don't need to have that because all of them individually, they'll all exploit the crisis in their own unique way, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. And the same with media as well. They're going to exploit it as well. And they're, just, they're going to use that to make money, to sell papers, to push influence as well. So, like I said earlier, like Boris Johnson was going through this whole non-lockdown method, you know, of, of herd immunity and basically, you know, individual responsibility, you know, you make sure to wash your hands. I mean, you don't need the government to tell you to wash your hand. That should be just normal anyway. But mm-hmm. do this, be sensible. Take, and I think if you left that to people, they wouldn't actually do Yes, there are always going to be wrong and in life. There's always going to be that. You get that now. There will always be lawbreakers. Gun laws, for example, gun laws don't work on criminals. That's the reason why they're criminals. Gun laws only work on law-abiding people. They only work if people respect the law. That's the only reason why they work. So all, the, all you've done is with gun laws is that you've actually de-armed the citizenry and now made them totally defenseless against the lawbreakers who have guns because they don't respect the law. It's like this. You're always going to have people not listening to government guidelines and doing what they want. You're going to have that anyway. Why should the majority be punished for the sins of the minority? You know, the media have pushed this and they are very much responsible for, for what is going on now. And just like with the government, not working hand in hand with them, but they've realized that they have really messed up on this and they're really trying to hide their tracks. We've caught them out lying already, saying that hospitals are in New York are like, are like war zones and you know, there's people everywhere. And then people are just going along with their iPhone, like recording, because there's no one here. There is no one here. And you've got that fake photo of, um, it's actually a hospital in Italy. And they've said, oh no, it's a hospital in New York. And they've gone, no, it's not. That's a hospital. You, you've purposely lied. And they've had, and CBS News, who did that, they have actually had to come out and apologize for that. How could you have made that mistake? That is near impossible mistake that you've made. Oh, it was an Edison option. So, so you've got this, this image from an Italy hospital and accidentally uh, edited over it saying it's a hospital in New York. It's absolute nonsense. They've been caught out and they're not going to apologize because they've gone too far of the lie. They've gone too far of it. And to say now that it's, it's human nature. Because you've gone so far with the lie, you can't stop now. And Well, you can, but the ramifications of that is going to be just as bad now that if they admit it. So they're just going to keep running with that lie, and they're going to try and destroy anyone who speaks out about it. So, yes, definitely the mainstream media are guilty for this, mate. They are, and anything that happens after this, if an economic collapse does occur, it's looking, looking at the market. They're not reporting on the markets either, which I find very unusual for the mainstream media because the big take is on COVID-19. So even though markets are pretty much collapsing around us, because they're gatekeepers, they're not reporting on it because they don't want to be responsible for it. So they're probably going to say, oh, it was because of COVID-19. No, it's because of your hysteria pushing that made this happen. Definitely going to me would ask something to blame for it. I think the best advice, obviously, to keep people healthy and to keep them safe is simply to use their common sense. Right. So uh, what was your journey into libertarianism? So where did you come from originally and what made you change your mind? I have been a voter or a supporter of every mainstream English party in Parliament. So I went originally when I was 18, I'm 32 now, originally at 18, the first of a party I voted for was the Green Party. Obviously, being a bit young and naive, I generally was just, well, my whole political ideology was basically trees are great. And that was it. But then looking more into that, I've started noticing that there were people who weren't exactly living the green lifestyle and were basically hypocrites, really. They were still going around in their big polluting sort of vehicles, you know, and they didn't really live the green lifestyle. So I sort of stopped supporting them. And then I became a pretty much a full on socialist. <laughs> I became a Che Guevara T-shirt wearing student, a typical stereotype. And I, I supported the Labour Party at the time. I lived in Lewisham in London. And Lewisham is one of the poorest boroughs in all of London. And all I ever saw, having been born and raised in Lewisham, 
Lewisham got totally worse every year round in terms of crime, in terms of wealth, you know, of, of individuals. Yeah. All the negatives have gone up and all the positives have gone down. And that, I think, unfortunately, is a typical aspect of Labour-controlled areas. As much slack I give to the Conservatives, at least the Conservatives believe in a, well, at least used to, believe in a positive sort of ideology. We believe you individuals, you know, entrepreneurism, don't let the state look after you. Labour are exactly the opposite. They want you to be forever reliant upon the state. They don't believe in you as an individual. They think that you're going to fail and they think that, no, don't risk yourself. Don't try and start your own business. Let the nanny state look after you and we'll make sure that everything looks after you. Fortunately, that isn't the case because, as I said earlier, as, as a state grows bigger, your civil liberties, your freedoms, they shrink. So after that, in my 20s, I then became a Liberal Democrat and I thought I'd finally found a party that was for me. I thought, you know, because again, we go by these names, but oh, Liberal Democracy. And what I sadly realized, having not, again, never been a member of the party, but I was closely associated with it, if, if you will, is that actually the Liberal Democrats, and I'm glad Brexit really exposed them, is that they are neither liberal nor they're democratic. And it's the same with the other parties too. The Labour Party does not represent the working class. The uh, the Green parties are a bunch of hypocrites and the world's going to end in 10 years. And the Conservatives are anything but conservative. So after my experience with the Lib Dems, when I was with the Lib Dems, I was actually, believe it or not, a Remainer and actually voted Remain in the 2016 uh, referendum. Okay. That's quite surprising because people who know me know I'm a very much a hard Brexiteer now. Yeah. But I, was, I remember that the week after the referendum, I went to a pub in East Stolage and met with my Lib Dem Remainer friends that I'd known for years. Again, had helped one of them become a local councillor in the area, had known them since school. And straight away from day one, they're already scheming to overturn the biggest democratic act in UK history. And I was and, and I was sort of said, well, hang a minute, no, we're Liberal Democrats. You know, we believe in democracy. Unfortunately, we lost. And that's the way it is. That's how democracy works. And as soon as I said that, I remember there was just pause. It was as if it was as if time had frozen. And all my all these friends or former friends, they all sort of looked at me gobsmacked as if I had just killed someone. And then they would say, oh, well, they didn't know what they were voting for. All the usual tropes, you know, oh, well, you know, people are stupid. They don't know what they're voting for. They're all racist. You know, all the usual sort of crap, yeah. Anyway, I was ostracized from that friend group and that was it, really. So mm. I then started voting conservative. And this is when I just moved to Kent as well. I noticed that the conservative areas, it seemed as though they were far superior area in terms of of, of living, you know, in terms of, of, of just, you know, just niceties, really. Obviously, I just had my reservations of conservatives, but I never thought of small parties because I wasn't exactly well into politics until mm. I discovered the Libertarian Party. It was only, I mean, I studied politics, but I was almost near apolitical. I still voted only when it was convenient. Like I wouldn't, if like if it was raining, I go, ah, oh, I won't bother voting today. That's how I was. That was my mindset. And that's why I think I was I was a Remainer as well. So anyway, um, in, I started voting for the Conservatives in the late twenties, and then this was sort of when Theresa May was the Prime Minister, and I started to realise then that ah, just like the Liberal Democrats aren't liberal nor democratic. The conservatives are anything but conservative. They're not like, you know, factured and they're, they're far removed from that. The conservatives are actually, they're not, they're not, I don't call them Tories or conservatives. I call them one nation Tories or one nation conservatives because whenever a Tory MP describes themselves as a one nation Tory or a one nation conservative, like my current MP who I stood against, that is basically politician talk or new speak for basically saying that I am not a traditional conservative. I don't believe in family values. I don't believe in leaving the European Union, usually pro-EU, and they believe in regressive, illiberal policies such as affirmative action instead of meritocracy. So they're very much against the traditional values of conservatism, of, you know, individualism, of, of entrepreneurism, of business, of, you know, not relying on the state. Mm. They are basically just another side of the coin of Labour. Had I to choose out of the two of them, it would obviously be the Conservatives, but obviously 
again, what's in a name? All of these parties that I've mentioned, they're the total opposite of what they actually believe in. Especially with the Liberal Democrats, is is that if they were a product of some sort, they would have been reported trading standards years ago for <laughs> for false advertisement. You know, it, 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 yeah. it's, it's disgraceful. So yeah. after that, I started exploring my ballots then. And I then made a decision that I'm going to either create my own party or I'm going to seek one out that at least shares a high majority of my and I didn't know what at this point I didn't know what libertarianism was I had heard the word libertarian but I didn't know what it was and it's funny because like I said earlier I actually studied government and politics in college and I still have my political ideology books and that's where I remembered it from that spark came back I went back to the book and I, I still have the book now and I just quickly went to what it was and it's amazing that there are pages and pages of what is socialism what is conservatism what is liberalism but when it comes to libertarianism there's one page then I started researching into it and it was only by chance that it was on Facebook and someone I barely even know she put up a status and then I commented on it. And then, you know, when someone else didn't comment on it, you get sort of a notification saying, oh, someone else has commented on this. So I just happened to go back and look. And I noticed that the guy who commented, he had in his profile picture, he had this little, what do you call it, a border within it. Mm. And it said Libertarian Party UK. That's when I remembered the libertarian uh, definition in that book. And that's where it, that's where it started from. I started looking into it. I'm like, yeah, I discovered Ron Paul. I was like, whoa, yeah, that's great. Um, and all these other things. And then I finally messaged a guy whose board it was. And I said, what is this party? And then through him contacting me. And I don't know who he is. I, don't, I can't remember his name. I then went to a London meetup in Victoria, where it usually is held every month, usually the last Saturday of every month. Went to it for the first time, met a bunch of people, loved it, really friendly people, really great. And then from then, it was the start of a beautiful friendship. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, I joined the party. And it's the first time I've ever joined a political party. Read the manifesto, read the party constitution, but that's it. So since then, I've become, I was the Kent leader at one point. I ran the Kent Libertarian page and... Then I started my own personal libertarian, you know, Sean Finch libertarian party page. Mm. Sort, sort of like, think of it as states in America. We all act as independent states, you know, independent bodies. And we have one a federal kind of body, which uh, helps. With it. But at the end of the day, it's really up to you as an individual how you want to run your local county page or meetups or whatever. Because obviously... Something that's good in London doesn't mean it's going to be good in Staffordshire or, or any other or Liverpool or wherever. It doesn't matter where it is. So, yeah. It's been a bit like uh, moving from Greta Thunberg to Murray Rothbard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because obviously you've stood in the general election uh, in Seven Oaks in Kent, uh, you got 0.6% for the Libertarian Party, which is the second highest percentage for the party in the election. Do you have any advice for those people looking to get involved with the party or standing as a candidate or anything like that? Um, I would have definitely advised for you to stand as a candidate because it was probably the only best way to actually keep your MP to account. You aren't relying on another person to do it for you. You are scrutinizing them. And also there, there is a loose chance as well that you can actually pass your ideas on to either a crowd of people via a hustings or even if you're lucky to actually get your MP to actually listen to your ideas. And you never know next time they vote for something. So definitely, yes, do stand for a uh, candidate. Very good. And on that note, I'll have to bring an end to the episode. <laughs> it's been great to have you on the show. Oh, great. Thank you, buddy. Well, join us again next time on The Libertarian Listener for more interviews.